Howdy friends. In this session we are going to be looking at um, core teachings in the Christian faith, what Christians call doctrine. Now, first of all, I want to point out that there's a big difference between doctrine and dogma. Dogma is something that you might hold rigidly at the expense of common sense or human kindness, but doctrine simply means a healing teaching. As we'll see later, this notion of healing is a very important one in the Christian tradition. So it's no accident that the words doctrine and doctor come from the same root. When we embrace these healing teachings, they solve problems in our lives and they bring us closer to God. Let's talk first about living inside of a story. To be part of any religion is to live inside the religion's story. Fortunately, that story is usually pretty big, so it's plenty roomy. Um, for those of us who follow Jesus, we live inside the Christian story. For us, that means the story of Israel that began with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and continues to the liberation of the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt. Then there's the time of the prophets and the Babylonian captivity. This is part of our story. And it's a part of the story that uh, we share with our Jewish brothers and sisters. But for Christians, that story of Israel continues in Jesus with his incarnation, ministry, crucifixion, and resurrection, and then the story of the church, not as a replacement of Israel, but as an offshoot, as another community that God is also loving and saving. To follow Jesus isn't just to swallow a bunch of random teachings that may or may not have you know, or make any sense in, in contemporary society. To follow Jesus is to live inside the story of Israel and Jesus. When we follow Jesus, when we're joined to him in baptism, we join our little stories to his big story. And this big story becomes our true identity. When we live inside this story of Israel and Jesus, everything else in our lives is oriented to it and finds meaning in reference to it. It's, it's kind of like the decoder ring that makes sense of an otherwise pretty chaotic world. Living inside the story reminds us that we're not alone, that we're part of something much larger than ourselves, and that even though we may die, the story is not finished. God is up to something here that is both really big and really good, and we are a part of that project. So let's talk about the incarnation of Jesus. We've already touched some on the incarnation in our discussion of the School of John, where we talked about holy wisdom becoming incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. Paul has a similar teaching when he records the earliest hymn in the Christian tradition. He writes, though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God honored him and gave him a name above all names. In Christian teaching, God felt separate from human beings and from creation and found this, <clears throat> this distance between us intolerable. And so, out of great love for us, God crossed that distance and became one of us, throwing in God's lot with the physical universe and uniting God's self with the created order forever, never again to be parted. Redemption. As a human being, Jesus shows us who God is and what God is like. As Paul tells us, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In his face, we see the face of God. He teaches us to care as God cares and to love what God loves. He also reminds us in his teaching that the God of Israel is the God who liberates from tyranny and he spent his earthly ministry liberating those who were oppressed, whether by Rome or by abusive religion or by hierarchical society or by evil spirits or by death itself. Many Christians believe that on the cross, Jesus 
closed the final distance between humans and God by satisfying some need that God has for honor or justice. Probably the most well-known concept was invented by John Calvin in the 16th century, who said that sin must be punished, and so God chose to punish Jesus for the sins of the world instead of us. A lot of Christians believe that, but a lot of other Christians, myself included, find the idea that what Jesus really came to save us from was God and God's anger uh, to be a pretty absurd notion and slanderous to God besides. Instead, many of us go back to a much earlier teaching that says that by his death, Jesus gained access to hell, busted the place up, broke down all of the walls, broke every lock and every chain, and set free all who were in captivity there. So that even today, although people often isolate themselves and walk into hell on their own two feet, God does not send anyone there and in fact sends Jesus to coax them out. But it's not God's way to coerce, only to persuade. And there will always be people who choose isolation over community. But after Jesus defeated the tyranny of hell, the cells there only lock from the inside. Anyone is free at any time to walk away into freedom. Resurrection. Christians also believe that once Jesus was finished busting up hell, he came back, rising, in again, rising again from the dead, and in so doing, crushing the power and the tyranny of death forever as well. The resurrection is central to Christian teaching. As Paul explains, if Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Now, Christians do not believe that the resurrected body of Jesus was identical with the body he had during his life, the body that died on the cross, although it is contiguous with that body. The resurrection body is both the same and different. It's physical, but it's also spiritual. It's corporeal, but it's also eternal. It is, in fact, a mystery that we don't fully understand and can't adequately explain. What we can say is that the goodness of bodily existence goes on and that death does not have the final word. The resurrection of Jesus accomplishes a number of things, First, it showed, that, it showed everyone who poo-pooed Jesus' teachings that he was right about everything after all. This is the resurrection as vindication of Jesus and his message. The resurrection destroyed the stranglehold of fear that Rome held over the people that it conquered. The only power Rome really had was the threat of death. And if death has been defeated, then what power did it really have? Why should anyone be afraid of them anymore? And why should anyone continue to put up with their tyranny. Finally, the resurrection destroyed the power of death itself, since Christians believe that anyone who is joined to Jesus in baptism will also share in his resurrection. Sin. All right, let's talk now about sin, one of the most maligned <clears throat> and misunderstood teachings in the Christian faith. People recoil from the notion because it seems to be saying that we're bad. But that's a terrible distortion of this teaching. The doctrine of sin, far from being oppressive, is in fact one of the most liberating and healing teachings in the Christian faith. Sin isn't something that we do. It isn't something inside of us that makes us evil. It isn't a corrupt condition of the soul that makes God hate us or mad at us. This is all terrible teaching and not what we would call orthodox or correct teaching. Instead, sin is a malignant force outside of us that oppresses us. The metaphor the church used very early on is that sin is a disease. It's a sickness. In fact, it's a socially transmitted disease since we all learn hatred and prejudice uh, on the knees of our parents and from those around us. But we all get infected by it pretty early on. So it's like a virus. It's not our fault that we get sick, and it's really not avoidable. And far from being angry at us about it, God is filled with both distress at the condition and compassion for us, because God sees how badly we suffer from this chronic illness. And because ours is the God who liberates from tyranny, God desires to liberate us from the tyranny of sin as well. 
So we're all sick, but the illness is manageable. You can see the whole of the Christian faith in terms of this medical model, in fact. Sin is the virus that we catch early on. Jesus is the physician who brings the medicine. The church is a hospital, caring for those who suffer with the condition and helping us manage the symptoms until the final healing of all things. In Christian teaching, there's no way avoid to avoid catching this disease. It is ubiquitous and inevitable. That's why we Christians say, I'm a sinner, and so is everybody else. This isn't really an admission of guilt. It isn't beating ourselves up. It's just a statement of fact, like, my hair is brown, or I'm right-handed. There's no shame in it. It just is. And we don't have to feel bad about it, because it infects all people equally. And that's one of the most liberating parts of this teaching. One of the things that Jesus really struggled with in his ministry was his fellow Pharisees who looked down their noses on the so-called sinful people. They believed they were righteous and so much better than all of those sinners. Christianity says, nuh-uh, there are no righteous people. There are only people struggling under the sickness of sin, and that means every single one of us. When Christian people really get this teaching, then there's no more finger-pointing. There's no more spiritual elitism. There's no us versus them. There's no more righteous people and wicked people. The doctrine of sin levels the playing field. There's no room for spiritual arrogance because none of us have anything to brag about. There are no good people and there are no bad people. There are just sick people, period. And the fact that we're sick is not our fault. The Trinity. The Trinity is an understanding of God that took a long time to develop in Christian teaching. But the roots of it were there even in the Gospels themselves. The Trinity says God comes to us in many different forms. The doctrine of the Trinity doesn't limit the number of ways that God can show up. It's not prescriptive. Instead, it's descriptive. It tells us about the three primary ways that early Christians experienced God. First is the transcendent creative force behind the universe, what Christians call the Father as the human one who healed us with his own hands and loved us with his own body, what Christians call Jesus, the Son, and as the spirit that fills and animates all things, imminent and infusing all creation. The Trinity is an acknowledgment that God has related to us in each of these three ways. There might be other forms God can take as well, but these are the three ways that our ancestors in the faith experienced God directly. One of the things I love about this teaching is that it really gives people options. I mean, relationship, real relationship, is always messy. Real relationship with God can get pretty messy, too. So if you're not on good terms with one member of the Trinity, that's all right. There's two others you can relate to. In our tradition, as long as you're on speaking terms with one member of the Trinity, you're pretty much good to go. All right, let's talk about sacramentality. Christianity is a sacramental faith, meaning that matter really matters. Scripture tells us that when God made the earth, God pronounced that it was good. Nothing has happened to change that pronouncement. Creation is still good, and in fact, nothing proves that quite as much as the Incarnation. God loved the world, the creation, matter so much that God wanted to become a part of it. There's hardly a more potent stamp of divine approval than that. God became a creature of flesh and blood, a creature of matter, precisely to reach out to us creatures of matter. Not because God despises matter, but because God desperately loves it. And ever since, God has been using matter to bless us. That's why we say our faith is sacramental. A sacrament is a physical thing that transfers or communicates spiritual grace and healing. There are no limits on what is sacramental. The loving touch of a friend can be sacramental if that touch communicates healing and grace. A meal prepared with love and care can be sacramental. A work of art can communicate grace and healing too. It too is sacramental. If we live in a world that speaks to us of God's love and concern for us, we live in a sacramental world. And anything that communicates God's love and care for us is, by definition, sacramental. Nevertheless, the Church has focused on several sacramental signs that have been particularly important 
for us in our spiritual lives. The Catholic tradition names seven sacraments, while the Protestant churches honor only two. But no matter what church you're talking about, these two sacraments always have pride of place. And those two sacraments are baptism and Eucharist. Baptism is the sacrament that initiates a person into the body of Christ. What that means is that when a person goes down into that water, their life of their, their separate existence, their life of isolation ends, and when they come up out of the water, their life in community begins. Baptism is the ritual that mystically unites us to Jesus and to every other person who is united to Jesus. Baptism makes us one being with Jesus. It incorporates us into him. It makes us a limb of his living body. Baptism is like a wedding ceremony. Once we are united to Jesus, all that is his becomes ours, his divinity, his immortality, his power, his resurrection. And likewise, once we are united to Jesus, all that is ours becomes his, our talents, our lives, but even the things we're not proud of, our failings, our sin, these are absorbed into him as well. The effects of our negative aspects are nullified and the effects of our talents and gifts are amplified for the good of others and for the world. One of those things that are Jesus's that become ours is his ministry. Once we are united to Jesus in baptism, we are now the living presence of Jesus in the world. We are Jesus now, and we are tasked with continuing his ministry of grace and healing in the world. Being the body of Christ isn't a metaphor for Christians, but a literal and living reality. Joined to Jesus, we are Jesus, and we are tasked with carrying on Jesus' work. The other great sacrament is Eucharist, and it too has its roots in Jesus' earthly ministry. Sharing his table with people was one of Jesus' favorite teaching tools. In the culture Jesus grew up in, to share your table with someone meant that you approved of them, and for a rabbi, to share his table with someone strongly implied that God approved of them too. And so when Jesus shared his table with prostitutes and Roman collaborators, with people that his culture considered dirty and sinful, he was issuing a scathing critique to the spiritual elitism of his day. By welcoming all people to his table, he proclaimed God's love for all people without regard for distinctions like holy or sinful or rich or poor or educated or ignorant. There was a place at God's table for everyone, everyone, everyone. Eucharist continues this practice, welcoming, welcoming all people to this table regardless of their social station, their race or ethnicity, their wealth or poverty, or most especially their perceived moral standing in the community. And as Christians gather around this table, something strange and wonderful happens to us. The veil of time is pulled back, and we are made present with that moment in the past when Jesus gathered with his friends at the Last Supper. Jesus is strangely and wonderfully present to us in the breaking of this bread and the sharing of this cup, not metaphorically, again, but mystically and truly. And at this same meal, the veil of time is pulled back, and we are likewise present at that future time when God will wipe the tears from every eye and all will feast at the great table of God at the conclusion of all things. In our church, we introduce the Eucharist every week by holding up the bread and saying, when Jesus gathered with his friends on his last night with them, he blessed bread and broke it. This is the bread that was served at that meal. Let us partake of that bread tonight. And then we hold up the cup and say, at the world's end, God will host a feast of rich food for all peoples, where none will ever be hungry or thirsty again. This is the wine that will be poured at that meal. Let us partake of that wine tonight. If baptism is like the marriage ceremony that joins us to Jesus and makes us flesh of one flesh with him, then Eucharist is like making love in which every week we share a time of intimacy with him to renew and strengthen the love between us. The healing of all things. When we talk about the work of Jesus, what is that work? That work is the ongoing and eventual healing of all things. This is what Christians believe God is up to. This is what everything is pointing to. This is what it's all about. 
Because of human sin, we are surrounded by brokenness, especially broken relationships. Because of this sickness that we all struggle with, this sickness that oppresses all of us, pretty much every relationship that matters to us has been negatively affected. For instance, our relationships with God have often been strained and broken, leaving us feeling distant and estranged. Our relationships with our deepest selves have been damaged, marring the beauty of the, whole, of the human spirit and driving millions of us into therapy, myself included. Our relationships with, the, with each other have been devastated, leading to war between nations, hatred and prejudice between communities, anger and estrangement even within our families and between us and the people we love the most. And finally, our relationships with the earth and her creatures and the entire created order have been damaged, leading us to behave in wanton and cruel ways toward those creatures and bringing us to the brink of environmental disaster. Every day, every one of us suffers from brokenness in these four directions. The Christian faith tells us that God's desire is to bring healing in all four of these directions and promises us that in the fullness of time, God will heal everything broken. Everything, everything, everything. The Hebrew prophet Isaiah gives us a glimpse of what this time might look like. He says, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines stained, strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over the nations, and he will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the hope that our faith is pointing to. The defeat of every tyrant. An end to every power that seeks to steal our lives from us and the eventual healing of everything wounded or broken. This is the good news promised in the gospel. It is to this good news that we Christians testify, and it is for this eventual healing of all things that we apply our hands.